Also this weekend, we have a few couples that are away at a marriage retreat in Sevierville, and we're thankful for them. Uh, we're thankful uh, for the opportunity that they had to go and to do that and for the investment that they are wanting to make in uh, their marriages. I was at that retreat for a little while and to be able to spend some time with them was a blessing to me and, and also to Tracy also. While we were there, they asked the audience, they said, if, if uh, people want to write in stories that, that you've learned lessons from and perhaps everyone could learn a lesson from, write it in and later on we'll read some of the stories. A couple wrote in a story that I'd like to share with you uh, this morning, parts of, of what they wrote. <clears throat> now, uh, before I do that, I, I want to say something and I really hope it's not a surprise to any of you husbands when I say this, but last Friday was Valentine's Day. Now, if right now you just cracked a rib, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Just remember, Adam literally lost a rib to get his wife. But when, when we think about, it is kind of interesting and sad how easy it is for us to forget things that we just ought not to forget. And that was the theme of this little paper that this couple wrote. And they talked about after several years of marriage, one day it was the wife's birthday in the middle of the summer. And the husband, as always, he had done a great job of remembering her birthday. Well, this particular summer day, birthday for her, he comes walking in with a card and a big smile. And he hands her the card and he says, honey, Merry Christmas. She kind of looks strange at him and he says, for real, you won't believe this. I bought this card at Christmas and I lost it and I just found it today underneath my truck seat. And so she laughed and she read it and it was a beautiful card and she waited for her birthday card. No birthday card. And she kind of was deflated because she thought, is he not going to give me a birthday card? So some time passed and it was time to go to evening worship. It's Wednesday night. And so they went to worship and Bible class. And after class, he got in the vehicle and he said, if you don't mind, I really need to make a quick stop at Walmart. There's something I've been planning on picking up. And she thought, well, he already knows what he's getting me. And he was so busy today, he didn't have time. And so she says, that's fine. They stop. They go into Walmart. And of course, she makes her way away from him so that he can buy the gift without her there. And so they meet back up in the front of Walmart and he is holding a gift right beside his face and he is grinning from ear to ear. And he walks up to her with the most beautiful tackle box you could find. And he literally says the words to her, happy birthday to me. He still doesn't have a clue. They start walking out across the parking lot and finally she thought, I've got to say something. And so she just says to him, happy birthday, honey, even though his birthday was months away. And their little seven-year-old pipes up and says, happy birthday to dad. Mom, today it's your birthday. And you could have scooped that poor fella up off the asphalt. The beauty of that story is that they say that he has never forgotten a special day since that time. You know, what is interesting, and surely all of us at some point in our life, we've been there, where we have forgotten a day and we think, how did I do that? But you know what is a lot more serious perhaps than that is not just forgetting a day. It's forgetting what it's all about. And what's interesting is we just had a few lines from the Apostle Paul, but even more important, inspired by the Holy Spirit to say, I want to talk to you as a family. And wives, I have just a few things I want to say and husbands and, and children and even fathers again. And, and not in a doubting type of way, but there have been times in the past where I've looked at this passage and I've thought, wow. That really is brief. As important as the family is, you would think that he would spend a little more time. And my Bible, 
Those verses are only 10 lines long. And then about a year and a half ago when I was studying this and the sister epistle of Ephesians, it dawned on me. He's been talking to what husbands and wives and parents and children ought to be. And if you notice there in your Bible, if you read the following verses after that 18, 19, 20, and 21, you pick up there at 22, he starts talking to bond servants. And then you read on to the fourth chapter in verse one, he talks to masters. In other words, what he's doing is he's going to some very specific roles that people fulfill in their life. What role do you fulfill in your family? What role do you fulfill at your workplace? Are you the employee or are you the employer? And what he does is he spends all of this before in Colossians to say there is a foundation that all people are to have in their life if they really are kingdom people. There is a framework that all people are to have in their life if they're really kingdom people. And then once he lays out some powerful, powerful teachings, then he says, now, if you're a wife, let me remind you to be submissive. It's fitting to the Lord. If you're a husband, let me remind you that you need to love your wife. And if you're a child, let me remind you, you, you need to obey your parents. It's pleasing to God. And if you're a father, let me remind you to not provoke your children and not discourage your children. Today, it may surprise you with the title of the lesson, what we're not going to study today. We're not going to study the text that was just read that tells the detailed roles of the husband and wife. But today we're going to study all of those foundational and framework teachings that God gives us to say, are you this kind of person? Are you this kind of kingdom person? And then if you are a husband, you ought to be able to say, I'm that kind of kingdom person fulfilling the role as a husband. Or I'm that kind of kingdom person fulfilling the role as a wife or as a child or as an employee or as an employer or as a parent. And so what I'd like for us to do is drop back and be reminded of the framework and the foundation that begins, which we have done many times because of our theme of kingdom living. If you will, flip back a page to Colossians, the first chapter in verse 13 and 14. Colossians, the first chapter, verse 13 and 14. Notice he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Who are we? We are people who have been conveyed into this kingdom. It's the kingdom of the son and of love. We have been delivered. And you remember each time we talk about, imagine if you will, you're a prisoner of war and a special SEAL team has been sent in and they're the only ones that can remove you from this prison. And this team is made up of one, it's Jesus Christ. Nobody else can deliver you. And what's interesting is he won't force you out. He'll say, look, I've paid the price. I've died on the cross. Therefore, verse 14, my blood can deliver you. I can take you out of this situation, but I've never forced anybody to do anything. Do you want to live in this power of darkness or do you want to live in this kingdom that I can translate you into? And the choice is ours. By his forgiveness, by his blood, it's offered to us. If we stay in darkness, we're going to be a different kind of husband, a different kind of wife a different kind of child, a different kind of parent, a different kind of employee, a different kind of employer. But if we're over here in the kingdom, we're going to be different from the world in all of those roles. This verse, these two verses tell us what Christ has done. Let's go into the second chapter in verse 11 and 12 and see what our response is to be so that we're letting the Lord know we're willing to serve under him 
and to allow him to reign in our life. How do we do that? This is the only time in the Bible where baptism is called the circumcision of Christ. And it's likened in a, in a metaphoric sense to circumcision under the Old Testament. In Colossians 2 and verse 11, it says in him, talking about in Christ, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. And Paul's there. Under the old covenant, the circumcision was always with the hands of men. And, and, and that circumcision was a removal of the foreskin of the flesh of the male to give the identity that this is a covenant person. And so now he's saying Christ is going to give you a circumcision and human beings are not going to be the one that conducts this surgery. That was a surgery in the old covenant. And so spiritually, there's going to be a surgery that takes place. Let's keep reading. And this is going to be without hands. In other words, God's going to do this one. And what it's going to be in the middle of verse 11 is putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. How? By the circumcision of Christ buried with him in baptism. And which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And so we're in this prison here and, and Christ is saying, I want to bring you out. And if our response is, I want to turn away from this world. I really do believe that you're the savior. I really do want to submit my life to you. I'm not ashamed of you. I'll confess you. I'll stand with you. And Jesus would say, let's get out of here. What you need to do right now is you need to be baptized into Christ. And in the waters of baptism, God is going to cut away the guilt of sin that separates us from God. And notice this, we are spiritually dead in darkness and we go into the water spiritually dead. And when we come up out of the water, not only are we raised out of the water, but when he's talking about raised here, he's talking about that we are raised into spiritual life. We were spiritually dead over here. And it is while we were passing through the waters of baptism that we are resurrected into spiritual life. Brethren, that is huge. And so now we don't resurrect a spiritual life to go live a spiritual death. We are raised in spiritual life to live in a kingdom where Christ reigns. That's why when we get to the third chapter in verse one, that is going to be our text today. In the third chapter in verse one, notice how it begins. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. What a statement. If you look at that phrase in the middle of verse four or, or in verse four at the beginning there, look at that phrase, Christ, who is our life. And we say, there, there may be someone visiting here this morning that you've not been here through January and February and you've heard us talk several times already in this lesson about kingdom living. And it's fair. We don't talk about that a lot. And it's fair somebody says, I don't get it. Well, what do you mean kingdom living? If you want to put it in other words, Christ who is our life. Because the idea of kingdom is where the king has rule or reign over us. So if we honestly are saying we're kingdom people, we're saying Christ who is our life, everything that we are, it's all about Christ ruling and reigning in our life. Well, how does that happen? Notice at the beginning of verse one, Colossians three, if then you were raised with Christ. You see, he's going back to this movement that took place in our life. We were in darkness and he's saying, now, if you were buried and raised into spiritual living, that means that now you are 
in Christ. You have the king reigning over your life. That's why he can say in verse three, we're dead and our life is hidden in Christ. That's why he can say in the beginning of four, when Christ, who is our life, appears. Now, you see where we're going, but I'm going to pause here for just a moment because I want you to keep this fresh in your mind. So what role do you play in your family? Say, I'm a husband. Okay, as a husband, can you say, Christ is my life? As a wife, can you say, Christ is my life? As a child, as a parent, as a grandparent, as, as grandchildren, as uncles and aunts, nephews and nieces, what about at work? As an employer, can you say, Christ is my life, my employees know it. What about as an employee? Can you say, sure, Christ is my life. Anybody that knows me well, they know Christ is my life. You see what he's saying? All of this is leading up to those verses that it would be very easy for us to say on one hand, that just seems like such a brief teaching about the family or about our place in society. And really when we drop back, we realize it's not brief at all. He's been talking about it for, for many verses before he gets to those very distinct roles. And so when we say, okay, if Christ is my life and I have truly been risen to live into this kingdom, I'm no longer in the kingdom of the world of darkness. Now I'm in the kingdom of light of Jesus Christ. What am I supposed to do? And he lays out some very, very clear teaching. Look again, if you will, there to the third chapter and in verse one. And notice what he says here. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Seek. If we're doing kingdom living, what must we do at all times? Notice this isn't seek in past tense that we have sought. In other words, well, there was a point in time in my life where I decided to become a, a disciple of the Lord and so I sought him out and now there's no more seeking to do. Do you realize if we truly are kingdom people, every day of our life, every decision that has to be made, we are seeking the will of God. Every day, your life is the result of the decisions you make. Every day, you make all kinds of decisions. You may say, a lot of the decisions I make are small decisions. Okay, you make small decisions. You may say, now some days I have some real big decisions. Okay, you make some big decisions. But the point is this, every day, your life is full of the decisions you make. And you know what God is saying? God is saying, if you're over here in the world, there's a, there's a, a slew of ways that you can make decisions. The standards are multiple. But if you're going to be a kingdom person, you have one standard to make your decisions. What's the will of Jesus Christ? Christ is the king of my life. He reigns. My life is hidden in him. What is his will? Notice the way he says that here is that we seek those things which are above. By nature, we do seek things and we seek guidance of how to make decisions. But by nature, we do not seek above. By nature, we seek things on this earth. And this goes back to 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verse six and seven, where he talks about we walk by faith and not by sight. By nature, we're much more comfortable walking by sight. It takes a lot of faith to have faith to not walk by sight, but instead to say, King, I trust you. Your will be done in my life. All of these things I see on this earth, I'm not going to trust those. I'm going to trust you. Now, I love it any time in Scripture that you can find bookends. And, and to be honest with you, I'm a slow learner. And I've just started looking for these just in the last year, or year and a half. And when I was studying this week, I found a set of bookends that I've never seen before in the book of Colossians. And I'd like for you to notice the first bookend, if you will, if you back up to Colossians, the second chapter and verse eight, this is one bookend of where we can seek. If we don't seek above, this is where we can seek. Now he's putting this in a negative sense to say, don't seek these. And he ends with the positive, but notice the negative things here that we could seek. When you say, I've got to make decisions every day. Where am I going to look for decisions? We have a beware here in, in Colossians two and eight, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. According to tradition of men, 
according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. You get up in the morning and you have a decision to make. Are you going to use some Asian philosophy that's hundreds of years old? Or are you going to use some modern day philosophy that you've heard lately that there's some kind of karma in the room? That's not very modern, is it? But yeah, there's some kind of something going on. And, and, and you, I read that the other day. I heard a TV show about that. That's how I'm going to make my decisions today. Are you going to do vain and deceitful things? You know, I think I'm going to stop by a fortune teller and, and I'm going to let her tell me, listen, it's deceit. She can't tell you the truth. She can't. I'm going to read the horoscope. Really? That's going to be your step. But see, it's so tempting to do those things because they're on our plane. We can see them. We can look the fortune teller in the eyes. We can see whether or not she looks sincere. We're so tempted to go with the things that are on this earth. Traditions of men. What kind of Husband decision are you going to make this week? Well, why did you make that decision? Well, that's just the way, that's the way my dad always did it. Why are you going to be the kind of mama you're going to be? Well, that's just the way my mama was. I'm not saying that to say you had a bad mother or a bad father. But do you realize our parents and our grandparents cannot be our standard of living? If we do that, we have started setting our eyes on the earth and not on the things above. He literally says right here, don't do the traditions of men. What are we going to do here in this congregation? Well, we're going to do it this way. Why? Because that's the way we've always done it. That's not a good way or a good reason to do something. If what we have always done is because it's from above, that's the reason we always do it. If what we've always done, we find out, is not from above, it doesn't matter if we have always done it. That is the time to repent. Listen, when he says, seek those things which are above, this is a daily, an hourly, a moment by moment way of life. It has to become the natural thing that we do as a spiritual person. When we were over here, what could we do? We could wrap our life up in the principles of the world. See that last one? And you say, well, I don't know what the principles of the world are. Yes, you do. You know 1 John 2, 15 and 16. He tells us three principles that everything in the world falls into. He says everything in the world will either fall into the lust of the flesh, what you have an appetite for. What is it you really want? Lust of the eyes, what you see and you just can't get enough of it. Greed, covetousness, the pride of life. I'm feeling pretty good about my answer right now. I know, I know what God says, but I think God would understand that this is best for me right now. That's pride. What's going to drive you? As a parent, what's going to drive you to make decisions? I just feel so good if I allow my child to do this. Does God feel so good if you allow your child to do that? Because that must be the standard. Seek those things which are above. But where's the other end of this book in? Isn't it interesting that it's right at the end of the principles of the foundation and the framework just before he goes into the details of the specifics of the relationship. Look with me, if you will, in the third chapter in verse 17. See how it's right before the detail of, of the family and of the work. Here's, here's the book in. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So we go back to the second chapter in verse eight and we have this whole list of standards that are earthly that we're so tempted to be drawn to. And then he says, no, no, no. Don't let anyone pull you away from Christ. 
Do all, everything you say, everything you do, do all in the name of the Lord. And you say, that's hard sometimes. It is. And Paul even says, in spite of it sometimes being hard, take time to give thanks. Thank God for his wisdom. Because listen, if we make decisions based on what we see and based on the earth, we're going to end up hurting ourselves, and we're going to hurt a lot of other people. This other standard will often go against our flesh and it'll go against a lot of our friends. And there will be people of the world that will not understand why we're making the decisions we make. But you know what? We will be a blessing and we will be a blessed ourselves and a blessing to all of our family and those around us. And Paul has that figured out and giving teaching inspired by the Holy Spirit. He says, be sure in the midst of that kingdom living that you thank God for that. It's beautiful. It's powerful. Seek those things which are above. Look at verse two, if you will. Verse two, set your mind on things above, not on the things of this earth. Set is the idea of locking in your mind. What is the first thing that is touched when we first start learning of Christianity? The mind. Imagine running into someone and say, hey, has, has Christ impacted your life at all? Maybe a coworker? Maybe an old friend that you hadn't seen in years and you start talking and, and you mentioned something about church or about being a Christian and, and they kind of look vague and maybe even ask something. You say, are you a Christian? And what if their response was, I, I don't know anything about Christ. How would you reach them? The first thing they have to do is to be willing to learn the mind. Set your mind on things above. So what if, what if they say, I'm willing to learn. Can you tell me what I ought to start reading? What if you hand them a Bible and what if you say, look, for the next couple of days, will you read the gospel of John through several times? And then let's sit down and let's talk. And what if when you sit down, they say, you know what? I've learned a lot about Jesus. I knew nothing about you. You what? I learned a lot about Jesus. And you know what they're also going to start saying? They're going to start saying, the more I learn about Jesus, the more I learn about me. And the more I learn about Jesus, the more I realize I need Jesus and I'm not really doing as well on this earth as I thought I was doing on this earth. We see a great example of it. Now, it's not exactly with this illustration, but it's an accelerated version of it in Acts, the second chapter. You remember what was preached on the day of Pentecost? That Jesus of Nazareth, by the way, Jews, he's the one you crucified if you're mixed up who I'm talking about. You crucified him, God resurrected him. That Jesus of Nazareth, you clear who it is? Yes, we're clear who it is. He's the Messiah. What? We learned something today. He's the Messiah. And what does it do when you learn it? If you have an honest heart, verse 37 said that they were cut to their heart. The knowledge became convicting. Set your mind on things above. Don't set your mind on the philosophies of the world, on the traditions of men, on the deceitful ways of the world, on the principles of the world. Don't set your mind on those things. Set your mind on Christ and what's going to happen. We're going to learn of him and we're going to have deep convictions that come out of it. The Bible speaks of the mind in a few ways, but one way is just what we've said, is the learning part, and the other way is also referred to as the heart. It's where our deep convictions are formed. Think about this. We take in the knowledge of God's Word, we believe it, it forms convictions, and from our convictions come our actions, our behavior, our daily life. When we are in the darkness of the world, we have a belief system that forms that life of darkness. But since we have been in the world of, of I mean, in the kingdom of Christ, our belief system has been totally reset. You know the verse that talks about all of this, and I'll just mention it quickly. Romans the 12th chapter and verse 2. Be not conformed to this world. Don't let this part shape you, but be transformed. We've talked about that transformation this morning. It's what Christ has done in our response. Be transformed, what? By the renewing of your mind. 
And then when our mind is renewed, notice the last part of that, that you may prove, he's talking about by your life, you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. If our mind has truly been set on the things above, we're going to live over here and God could look down from heaven and he could point to somebody in the world and say, you want to see what it looks like lived out? Watch that person right there living in the kingdom. You see them? They're doing kingdom living. They're proving what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He could go over here to somebody in the world and he could say, you see this person? They're not doing it. And then those people that are trying to stand with one foot in both places, he'd also say to them, they're not doing it either. We seek every day. We have decisions to make. We seek. We set. We have firm, firm convictions. How firm? Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give thee a crown of righteousness. How do we do it? Well, there's a motive that is amazing. Let's read it and we'll close. Look at Colossians, the third chapter and verse four. Here's the motive. When Christ, who is our life, that beautiful phrase, but he's going to appear. He's our life right now. In other words, he reigns in our life, but one of these days, he's coming back for all those that he's reigning over right now. When Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. That's amazing. One of these days, one of these days, you and I are going to look into the clouds and we're going to see the glory of Jesus Christ appearing. And it'll either be while you and I are still alive or it will be when, when the graves are split open and we resurrect and we're caught up in the clouds. But either way it happens, we are going to see the Lord coming in glory. I want you to imagine for just a moment, I don't know how to illustrate this to you, but this is the best I have this morning. I want you to imagine the sight that you have seen where you've just said, that's the most amazing sight I've ever seen. It may be a particular sunset. It may be the first time you held a child or a grandchild. It may be maybe some waterfall somewhere that just everything was just perfect at that moment. And, and it, it was probably one of those moments where you just maybe were silent in awe. Or maybe you just kind of blurted out, wow. Or unbelievable. Or awesome. But it was that that you just couldn't take your eyes off. He just said, I've never seen anything like it. Brethren, that day is coming where we're going to look in the clouds and we're going to see something like we have never seen. The glory is going to be unbelievable. And then what? It's just really amazing is that he's coming to receive those that are in the kingdom so that he can share his glory with us. That glory that we see, he's inviting us to come and live outside of the realm of time and outside of the influence of anything that is earthly and is temporal and is defiled. Listen, as beautiful as this earth is, there's things all around us that have reflections of the worldliness and of the sinfulness and of the darkness in this world. One of the most beautiful things of heaven is definitely going to be the fact that God is there. But another thing that's going to be amazing about heaven that you and I have never seen is we've never seen an environment where darkness has no influence. What is the glory going to be like when he comes and he scoops us off and he delivers us into a place that the only thing that exists is glory? There's no need for the sun. The glory of God will brighten the way. There's no need for forgiveness of sins there. No sins are there. How can I get up every day and seek? How can I have my conviction so firm that I'm, I'm set upon it? If I remember that motive, that motive that every day I'm living for that glorious return. 
So how would that change the way I live life? What I learned today, I learned who I am. I hope that all of us can say, I am not a person of that darkness. I am a kingdom person. Number two, I learned where I am. I'm not in the world looking horizontal. I'm in the kingdom looking up for all direction, for all guidance. And I've learned, where am I going? I'm going to a glorious place. And how does that affect me as does that a husband or a wife or as a parent or a child or any other family member or a coworker? How does that affect that? I want to take as many folks as I can. What kind of husband? would a man be if he said, I understand that glorious coming is coming and I'm not really concerned if me nor my family was ready. What kind of wife or what kind of mother would get her kids ready for earthly living but not care about the glorious living? What kind of worker am I if I share only in the secular and never care about anyone spiritual? You see, it becomes really, really clear that when we read those verses of the roles, there's a lot of teaching that came before that that helped us have a foundation and a framework of really who we ought to be. This morning, I beg you to live a life that proves you can't wait for God's glorious return. And if we can help you prepare for that in any way, come as we stand and as we sing.